are back to episode two of Tina Talk down here at the FOA. My name is Tina Vell Thomas, and as you know, I am serving as the acting executive director here down at the Field Operations Academy. I really wanna start by thanking all of you who tuned into our first episode. It was a lot of fun. I uh, had the pleasure of having uh, CDI Shavaria here and we had a really good time. And today I am joined with yet another incredible member of our staff, Mr. Peter Cole. <sighs> I think it's so funny that I did that last time too. It's like expecting someone to run it and say like welcome, but maybe they'll add in some like crowd cheering in the background. Like film it's in front needed, of a live right? Of, yeah. It's right? needed. Yeah. Guys, it's needed. Live studio audience, right? It, yeah, it, see? See? See the craziness. Right. I love this. Right. But Pete, welcome to Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, Tina Talk. Really excited to uh, to be here. I remember when I first came down, had a conversation with you, talked about a little bit about what you do here and, and certainly ways how you can help individuals. I actually went to CDI Cole to asking about how I can get some help myself too. So help everyone can ask for help. It doesn't matter who you are, um, but certainly when we're looking at going to experts, everyone here knows who to go to and um, it, exactly why we have him here on today's show. So if you can please introduce yourself to the audience and tell us yes, who you are and what you do. Yes, absolutely, thank you. So I'm uh, Peter Cole, I'm a supervisory uh, CBP officer, CDI here at the Academy. I've uh, been here since March of 2020. Awesome. Yeah, so it's been uh, it's been a long four, four and a half years. Yeah. Uh, I started out in uh, physical techniques yeah. as a, uh, uh, PTD instructor over there. And then we got the op wonderful opportunity to build the tactical health and fitness branch. And yep. now I'm a, I'm a coach with, yep. the, uh, with tactical health so and fitness. So you started at the FOA during COVID. So the first week I got here, yeah. at the end of that week, we yeah. sent students home on the first shutdown. Oh my goodness. So yeah. it was, that's all I've known. Uh, you know what? It's so funny that you say that because I, I too entered on a new job during March 2nd, 2020 was my first Same day yeah. as a GS-15 uh, um, area assistant port director, oh, passenger operations at JFK. I was shutting down an entire airport. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? COVID, what is that? Crazy. It was very crazy, yes. but you adapt, Yes. right? And who would think that it's four and a half years ago at this point? So right. it's been really exciting. So give me a little bit about what you do currently here at the FOA. Okay. So right now I manage the tactical health and fitness program, um, which mainly is just making sure that we are uh, presenting the, the physical fitness training the okay. way that it's presented yep. by our exercise physiologists, but also coaching classes at the same time. Yeah. So we are responsible for physically preparing uh, CBP, officer basic training uh, yes. trainees for yes. the, the physical demands of the, not yes. only the field, but a life in law enforcement and getting them healthy so that way, not only are they healthy enough to, you know, span their entire career, Correct. but also have a healthy life afterwards. I love it. I love it. In fact, when I before I came down here, had many conversations uh, with XD Holzer, and you talked about the growth of the curriculum in general and the addition of T half and those soft skills and really yeah. looking at those life skills, like you just mentioned, and how incredibly helpful that is right. to the trainees because a lot of them don't really realize just how important it is to carry on all of the fundamentals that you've learned here in the academy, uh, especially those life skills, and right. take it back with you to the port. Right, it's so important, right? Right. Because you look at academy as a very short period of time, and it's our period of time with those with those um, officer basic Correct. trainees, right? That's Correct. our period of time. But when they leave here and they go out into the field and they start working at their ports of entry or you know going to advanced trainings and going on TDYs and doing all sorts of things, that portion of their career is a much greater period of time. Yeah. We have a very short period of time to prepare yeah. them for that. And we want though that foundation to be set so solid that they rely on it throughout the rest of their career. I love it. I absolutely love it. So, so uh, walk us through it. Let us know. Everyone knows what the current standards of the mm -hmm. FST is and kind of explain a little bit of FSTs. I know I'm using acronyms, but I'll leave it to Cole to explain it. And then certainly how t how the THAP program has changed uh, the, the training program overall. Okay. So what most people who are going to be seeing this and some a lot of the officers and agents, supervisors, and managers of the field will, will remember when they came through the academy 
is those PT tests used to be called FGS. Yes. Right, they used to be called yes. FGS, which stood for fitness graduation mm -hmm. standards. Well, when we created the tactical health and fitness training program, we kind of retooled that mm -hmm. to uh, FST, which is now a fitness status test. Because awesome. uh, four times throughout their time here at the Academy, we really want to just check in on them yes. and see how they're doing, how they're progressing, or even when they first get here, yeah. where are we starting at? Absolutely. Right? So that fitness status test has three events. Mm -hmm. uh, the first event is the 220 yard run, uh, or we've also been called the 220 yard dash, dash right? Yeah. Uh, and they are required to run that in 45 seconds or less. The next event after that are the push-ups. Uh, they do push-ups for one minute, and the minimum passing score for that event is 24 push-ups inside yep. of one minute. And those yep. push-ups are pretty strictly graded. Yep. Yeah, there's a whole protocol that, that, uh, that's laid out and read to the trainees before they do the push-ups, yep. along with a visual representation in order to show them what, not only what it looks like, but what, how they're going to be graded. Yep. Yeah, we're recording this very timely because I had the honor of watching a class do their final FST yeah, yesterday, yesterday, and yeah. it was pretty incredible just to see the level of details all of the instructors go through yeah. Even though we all know that it was their fourth time taking it, yeah. the instructions were given the same way every single time. And of course, to see their attention when they were actually performing the test. So it was really incredible yeah. to watch. That's good to hear. Yeah. We really don't want these trainees to be unprepared for a test. Right. Right. We do not want them to be unprepared right. at all. We also don't want there to be any surprises. Correct. Right. The last event is the 1.5 mile run, yeah. which is the one that everybody seems everybody to have a really hard that. time with, right? Yep. Uh, it's an, uh, six laps around the track in 15 minutes or less. And we utilize a run timing system here now at the uh, Field Operations Academy yep. to assist us in the start and finish times for those trainees. So we can see down to the one thousandths of a second when they started and when they finished. And there's no question anymore about whether or not they ran enough laps yep. or whether or not their time was ab above or below yeah. the, the standard. It was incredible. There was actually one trainee yesterday who I saw that their time was just, I mean, you're talking about 0 0.5, yep. 0, 0 0.05. Yeah of a second within passing yep. and to know that we have technology that assists us um, down to those increments is really incredible yeah. because it, you know, it takes the human error out of it. Right. Yeah. Right. And it really puts us in a position to be able to, you know, get these trainees the information that they need when they need it. Right. Yeah. Being right. able to have uh, that, that specific of information. Right. And this is really incredible for um, any of those folks who follow our social media accounts and people who are super interested in joining CBP or joining the, the field operations uh, and come into the field operations academy. This is information that is critical for you yeah, because we know that everyone's always interested. We get the, the questions and the messages all the time on our social media accounts where people are asking, what do the standards look like? And so I really appreciate you briefing that well, out so that they, they know uh, what to expect. So if you have any questions, please send them our way. We'll love to uh, answer those questions questions Absolutely. in real time. Um, so I understand that you were uh, instrumental in creating THAP. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't say I was instrumental, <laughs> right? I was just one person of a very large team of yeah. people, much smarter than I am, yeah. uh, that were kind of tasked with this concept mm -hmm. of what we, uh, 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 that we had at that moment in time. And then it just kind of turned into what we have now. Sure. So prior to tactical health and fitness mm -hmm. and what I'm, most people call the 101 day yep. program. Yep. The CBP OBT training was uh, in an 89 day program and all of our fitness was kind of married up with all the physical techniques or the TRTs sure. right, that yep. happen over in PDD. And when we stopped and looked at whether or not our trainees were getting what they needed, were, were we giving them the attention that they needed? Were we educating them the way that they needed to be educated? Sure. Uh, as far as fitness goes, we really went back to the curriculum and when we pulled out all the physical training, we noticed that we only had 12 hours mm. of structured physical training, wow. of structured physical training over 89 training days wow. in the academy. That's all we could point our finger back wow. to. I'm thinking back to when I went through the academy. It certainly didn't feel like it was only 12 no, hours. No, right, <laughs> right. But in, we also understood that in those physical techniques classes, the TRTs, that there was going to be an element of physicality. Oh, of course. Right, of course. As, as there should be. Yeah. But does that 
equal to actual structured teaching somebody how to be fit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They're not one and the same. No, they're not. Yeah. They're absolutely not. Absolutely. And we and in addition to that, we started seeing a lot of students show up here for day one very un you know, not physically fit. Yeah, not prepared. Not prepared. Right. Whether it was lifestyle choices, whether it was COVID, whether sure. it was a, a you know, a myriad of different things that it could have been, you know, sure. in, in that individual's life. Sure. We can't go back and change that. Right. We need to be have prepared officers and agents. So what can we do? to help them. And that was that was the big push. That's that awesome. was the big push. So we got with uh, uh, a lot of the senior staff here at the academy and our exercise physiologists who are here on center with the uh, yep. Occupational Safety and Health. Yep. And Mr. Holzer at the time said, write a program. So give me give me the best thing that you got. Yeah. So between our group, we came up with a 101 day. They have uh, structured physical conditioning uh, at least three times a week. Yep. At least three times a week. And they're with a coach. They're learning something or exercising something that they've already learned or learning sure. a new skill. And it's it's very much intended around any CBP trainee that leaves, that graduates the academy, becomes an officer. They can walk into any gym anywhere in the United States and they know how to use all the equipment and they know what to do in order to uh, continue uh, down their, their health journey, their wellness journey. It. Yep. I love it. That's incredible. And I think uh, the biggest thing is just knowing the, the data and the science that yep. you all use to create the program. Because it's very easy to identify an issue and say, look, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. How do we address this? But being able to use the data and to show, well, hey, we only had 12 hours that were dedicated to this, right? right? Did we put great officers out on the front line? Absolutely. Sh absolutely we did. But did we do our best to equip right. them for life changes and you know keeping up that phys physical conditioning for their entire career and beyond maybe not right a potential gap that we needed to address and i love that you all address that gap and it plays right into the resiliency piece as well yes right absolutely because your mental health is yes. tied right in with your physical health yes right if one goes down then the other suffers and then it starts trying to build the other one back up and we know that our officers and agents and all of our uh, everybody out of our ports of entry have been just it's been hard. It's it been has. really, really hard. And it's it just has. one more tool that we can give them in order to continue to keep them resilient and give them something to rely on yeah. when they reach those tough times in their careers yeah. and lives. You know, I, I can, speaking from experience, if I go more than like five days without working out, right. I want to punch a wall. Right. <laughs> like, right. And I'm like, I'm going out for a run. People are like, didn't you just run yesterday? I'm like, you should be very happy that I run on a regular basis yeah. because you get the calm, yes. me, right? <laughs> I have an outlet for where I'm putting all of this frustration that yes. builds up. And that ties back into our stress level because we know that our jobs are incredibly stressful. And so again, just to tie that back and just keeping, keeping all of that in mind when it comes to success for life yeah. beyond just being uh, functional and successful within your job. So and we also another thing that we really push with them is or I shouldn't say we push with them, but another focus of the uh, of the program is to promote fitness in a positive environment. Yes. Yes. Right. Because we've all had stories, experiences or we've witnessed, you know, physical fitness oh, in, sure. either in a military or law enforcement yeah. environment where it just wasn't very positive. Right? right. There was there wasn't a lot of support. Maybe it was somewhat degrading. Yeah. We we really wanted to stay away from that whole aspect yeah. of fitness inside of a law enforcement yeah. uh, environment and really put uh, really put positivity back into I love fitness. that. I love that. It, it kind of like a twist on it, that positive reinforcement. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. So what challenges did you face creating the program, if there were any? Oh, there were. Yeah, there, there, I'm there, sure. There were. Any, anything that changes anything new, comes right? with, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. So one of the, so we had basically had two really big challenges. Uh, the first one was, where are we going to do this? Sure. And the second was, who's going to do this? Sure. So when it came to where, uh, we're here at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. They have some wonderful facilities, but for the amount of trainees that we have coming through here on an annual basis, those facilities weren't going to, you know, support the program that yeah. we had written. Yeah. And we were pretty dead set on making sure that we gave our trainees, gave our agency the very best thing that we could sure. put together. Sure, absolutely. Um, so between the facilities that are at the, uh, over at the Physical Techniques Building, 
we actually uh, stepped up and supported financially the purchase of some more equipment in order to be able to provide all the venues that we That's needed awesome. in order to uh, train our, you know, give every trainee the access they needed. I love needed. CBP. Right? We're always like, you know what, if there's a wall, we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. The second thing was who's going to do this. Yeah. Right. Because back to doing it in a positive, uh, in a Correct. positive manner, you got to have the right person in that, in front of that class. You got to have the right person doing that job. Right. So we recruited from our incoming list of CDIs that had applied. We had also reached out and kind of uh, talked to some people that we knew were considering coming to the academy as uh, as CDIs. Sure. People that we knew were really uh, had just had that positive mindset. Sure. Right when it came to fitness. And we encouraged them to apply, and we also, you know, interviewed yep. uh, the you know, the people that were applying here, and we took the cream of the crop. That's we really awesome. did, and we uh, our exercise physiologists created a training program yep. uh, that would teach them all how to teach the material that they right. had written, and made sure that they were all, you know, a physically able yeah. to do the job, yeah. right, and physically able, uh, you know, competent enough to deliver it and deliver it right. safely. And uh, we kicked off July of 2023. That is awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, just looking from a mindset perspective, and I'm a firm believer, if you have the right people who have the right mindset, it makes it so much it easier does. to get whatever the material is that you're trying to get across, it to get does. it across. And that is critically important in physical conditioning aspect because let's face it, Push-ups are hard enough, running a mile and a half is hard enough, right? Yes. You're going to need some type of mental stamina and motivation to be able to get through either one of those. Yes. And when you see that reflected in the people who are teaching you, that's important because it, it can really help to get over those humps for sure. It certainly can. Yeah. And understanding as well is that we're not training college athletes here. <laughs> that we're is We're not training very true. professional athletes. That's true. No. Even though a lot of us think that we are. You Absolutely. Know, just, I mean, yeah. we all have our own, <laughs> what we identify as, right? Right. But, uh, <laughs> but when, it comes to, when it comes to expectations, right, we yeah. have our standards. Yeah. There are standards, but our expectation is not only to meet those standards for, for fitness, but what are we doing to empower? What are we doing to develop? What are we doing to build up these trainees? Of course. And set them up for success. In of the course. I love it. I love it. So what does a day in the life of a T half instructor look like? It's a busy day. I can imagine. It's a very busy day because we don't have a lot of coaches mm -hmm. here right now. Yeah. But we've been very, very blessed to have uh, other uh, CDIs from other branches yep. have gone through the training yep. and they're there to assist us uh, you know, when, when we need the help. But a day in the life of, the, of a T half coach, yeah. you're probably going to find yourself in a, in a physical conditioning session, yep. right? So you'll have your session uh, that you're assigned to, and they're broken into two, uh, two uh, uh, sections, an alpha section and a bravo. Okay. So you'll have your list of what the workout is for that day, and it'll lay everything out for you from the warm up to the calisthenics, to the conditioning, to the core workout. Right. And you'll follow your follow your plan. If your class is, uh, you know, advanced along in the program and it's yeah. a point where you can kind of take you take your hands off the reins a little bit with them, you might yeah. join them for a workout <laughs> and you know, get your workout in <laughs> with them. Of course. Right? But if there's any time where they're learning a new element or learning something new, we're responsible for teaching it to them, demonstrating it for them and then making sure that they're doing it properly. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And I can imagine maybe like the setup for the classes takes some time as it well does. too, right? It does. Yeah. So how successful has the program been for the trainees? What would you say? I like to say it's been phenomenally yeah. successful. Yeah. I do. And I, I know that I'm being totally biased, I really but I do. think that it has been as well because I've seen I've seen the quality of the trainees um, that the FOA has been able to put back out in the field. And I saw that, you know, being a port director back in Port New York, Newark, and seeing a lot of the, the folks that we were getting back there. But now sitting in this role and actually going to the classes, seeing the growth of the trainees, absolutely successful. Yeah. So in addition to uh, being a T-half coach, I also watch all the numbers, right? Yeah. Because we're numbers-driven. That data totally is important. Get it. We talked is about very, the data. Very important. Yep. It's very important. And we track how well these trainees are progressing through each through the entire program at each one of those FST yeah. or uh, status test points. We had a trainee from the last class that took a final just yesterday. Yep. Right? Yep. He lost 63 pounds wow. while he was here. That is 63 impressive. pounds over 20% body fat. 
That is impressive. It was very, very impressive. Oh, my goodness. The, the gentleman had a lot to lose. Yeah, yeah, obviously, of course. Obviously, when he got here. He absolutely did. But he put in the work. Yeah. Right? And he was he was uh, supported by his the coaching staff. Yep. Right? And his teammates in his session supervision. Yep. And it showed. Talk about the best overall environment for you to do that in a safe right. way. Right. right? In a, that's really important. In a safe way. In a safe in way. In a safe way. In a safe way. And to think about all of those tools that we've now given him, we go back to those life skills and sustainability. What does that look like for him in the future? That's incredible. Yeah, it was really, really uh, heartening to see that yesterday. Yeah. So we've, uh, our overall success rate yeah. has increased. Uh, in a, a percent is a percent. Some people don't think yeah. it's much, but when you're dealing with like a 95 to a 96 percent yeah. over a period of time there's a lot of numbers that go into making that that one percent go up that of course. Uh, that one increment but uh, we've been very very happy to just continue to watch our numbers go up that's cool uh that this is i i love this conversation listen you. you know that i'm a fitness junkie by now i think a lot of people who watched the, the podcast probably know that probably as know well that. too so i am like all in my element with this so it's exciting i i love this conversation so two last questions that i have for you yes ma'am what motivates you that's a that's a really good question. I, know, I always like to catch people off guard. You did. You caught me off guard. Yeah. Today. What motivates you? Um, I just I just want to help. Yeah. Yeah. I've uh, I've been I was raised in a, a service uh, related uh, you know service driven family. Yeah. Right, and that just kind of wore off on me through my parents. Yeah. And all I really want to do is I just want to help whoever yeah. needs help in whatever way that may be. Yeah. Right, and in this particular case here at the academy, I was kind of thrust into a situation where a lot of people needed help and yeah. they needed it now. Yeah. And it just, with being surrounded by the right people at yeah. the right time, everything just kind of came together. Right on yeah. time. Yep, yeah, right on time. Everything happens when it's supposed to. It does, to. when it's supposed to. Yeah, and, it, and one of the things that I love about CBP um, and specifically within the Office of Field Operations, so many opportunities to be able to help people, whether it's internally be it our trainees and, and, you know, to tie it directly back to the FOA, definitely our trainees, whether it's the officers or on the agriculture side, but then also as an extension of our mission and what we do. Right. So many different facets to just go out there and do the good work and stay true to our our uh, core values, yes. right? Of that that integrity, that vigilance, that service to country, it's huge. And so I love asking people that question because I think sometime if you are naturally a public servant or just naturally someone who thinks with that in mind, you're not necessarily thinking about what is that driving mechanism that allows you to do and be of good character, right? But when you really sit down and think about it, it's just the desire to want to help it's people just, is what is. what drives you. And so that's incredible. Yes. So what advice would you give to new trainees who are just coming on to the job okay. or some of uh, the, the people out there who we know are interested in joining CBP and for them to prepare before they come here because we know our program is phenomenal. Yep. But what we would love to see is also, you know, to go back to that point of making sure that you're prepared when you yep. come down to the academy because the more uh, um, work that you do on the front end, it's easier to integrate into the program. It certainly is. So what advice would you give to uh, to those individuals? My advice would be pretty simple. Uh, don't wait. Don't wait. Please, I love that. Don't, don't wait. wait. Don't wait. Um, if this is something that you're considering, and believe me, we need you. We yes. need each and every one of you. And this is something I say to my trainees all the yeah. time. I say, we need each and every one of you, but we don't need you uneducated. We don't need you broken, and we don't need you unhealthy. I love that. Right. So while you're here, we're going to work on educating yeah. you, you know, making sure we don't break you and getting you healthy. Yeah. But if you're if you're considering this job, especially from the from the fitness side, don't wait. Start right now. You don't have to do a lot, but you have to do something. something. And if you start doing something right now, it's going to be so much easier when you get here. We're going to see numbers that are going to put you in a less risk category yes. for the fitness portion being your detriment while you're here. We don't want that to be anybody's case. Yep. Oh, I love that. I love that. Don't wait. You have to start putting in the work as soon as you know that whether it's law enforcement, yep. 
um, that you're interested in or or just, you know, serving your country in any capacity. Right. And I, I love that idea because I've seen quite a few people who we onboard and you see that they didn't put that work in. And I feel terrible for them because I know that there is some type of struggle that is going to be ahead of them larger than what it could have been had they done some type of preparation. Correct. And I think to your point of the programs that we have built and putting that information out there to let people know this is a way how we can help you while you're here. But the more that you invest in yourself before you get here, the better off of an employee that you would absolutely. be. Absolutely, absolutely. That's exciting. Pete, thank you so much. Thank you for This for was me, such man. a great conversation. Thank I you. love it, I love it. Um, we're gonna close with a few questions. I did get a couple of questions uh, from some of uh, our colleagues here in the FOA. And last time I didn't get to answer any of the questions. Go so I promised it. that at least today that I would answer at least one or two. So I'll start by uh, just picking the first one off of the paper that I see. And so this one says, what inspires me? Um, a few things. I thoroughly enjoy doing good work. And right. I know that that sounds really fundamental, um, but it kind of goes back to what you were saying that you just want to help. Yeah. I, I, I always dream that when my time comes and it's time for me to leave this earth, that you know, someone up there, the universe would say, well done soldier, you've yep. done your best. Right. You, you, you gave it all that you could. And for me, that really drives me every single day to give 110%, even on the days where sometimes I really don't feel like it, yep. you know, I but that days. really drives me because, you know, my dad always used to say, regardless of how bad you think you have it, someone out there certainly has it way worse than you. And, you know, as an eight year old, when he would say that to me, I would look at him like he was crazy. <laughs> it never made sense. Um, but as I was growing up and I got to understand exactly what he meant, I'm like, wow, you're that's so true. Right. And so thinking with that in mind, thinking about how incredibly blessed I've been in life in general to include blessings that I've gotten within CBP, that's been such an inspiration for me. And that continues to drive me. And, you know, especially since I became a mom. It's like now I have a, a 12 year old at home who would keep me accountable. If I start slipping up, he'd be like, mommy, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> so that definitely inspires me because I know he's checking. He made the mistake to Google me one day. I was oh. like, what are you doing, kid? Let's not do that again. Um, so that's it. And then um, the other one that says, uh, what is your leadership style and where did you develop it? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think, I love to be that type of leader who puts people first and think about what every single person brings to the operation. Because I think that that's truly the way how we can affect the CBP mission the best, right? right. Um, if we are thinking with people in mind, having that empathy, I have this, this vision back in Newark that I say dare to lead and my entire team back there knows it is the leaders. It's, it's really corny, but it works. Um, but the L stands for leadership, really simple. E, having that empathy for every single thing that we're doing. You don't have to walk in someone's shoes to know that they may be struggling with something. Right always keeping ourselves accountable for what we're doing. And the D is just to stay driven for the job. And that's um, totally something that I always try to do every single time. And I always say, I don't care if I'm in a place for two days, two months or two years, I wanna have the same impact and leave an impression, yes. whatever it is. So I hope that that's a little bit of my leadership style. Um, and I always ask people to keep me accountable if it's not looking that way. So I'll extend the same thing to you, Absolutely. Cole. Absolutely, likewise, ma'am. And the entire team here uh, at the FOA, but it's been such an exciting journey for me. I can't believe it's almost three months that I've, since I've been here. And uh, being able to do the podcast here has been absolutely incredible. And I really thank you for joining us Thanks today. Thanks for having me, ma'am. It's been wonderful. Awesome. Well, that's it. That's our second episode of Tina Talk. Um, let us know if you're enjoying this. Please send us your questions if there's anything uh, that you'd like for us to cover. And most, most importantly, if you'd like to join us, please send an email because obviously I can't do this by myself. All right. Tina Talk out. Bye.